Major funding for the rebroadcast of this series has been provided by the Charles H. Revson Foundation, the estate of Mortimer J. Harrison, and the Jacob Burns Foundation. Additional funding has been provided by the Lemberg Foundation. Major funding for this series was originally provided by the Charles H. Revson Foundation, Petrie Stores Corporation, and the National Endowment for the Humanities. Additional funding was provided by the following. A complete donor list is available from PBS. The story of civilization is the story of our origins, of how we came to be the way we are. It is a family tree of lost nations, ruined empires, buried cultures, and a surviving strain of ideas that inspired our ancestors values that ruled our history and shaped the modern world. In this 5,000 year genealogy, there are many great traditions intertwined. One of them, old enough to carry memories of the mistiest beginnings, runs unbroken to the present day. Follow that single thread, and you follow a course of ideas that gave meaning to the experience of civilization. It is the tradition, the story of the Jews. I'm Abba Iben, a Jew, a citizen of Israel, educated in England, by training a scholar of history and language, in recent decades a diplomat and member of my country's parliament. In the nine one-hour episodes of this series, we're going to show you history through a microscope, focusing on the experience of a single small people, small in size and space and power. We tell their story, not just because of its constant drama, but because their ideas have played a central and influential role in human affairs. Because their history is a link between our origins and our present. You cannot recount the story of civilization without coming face to face with what the Jews have thought and felt and written and performed. <laughs> Who are the Jews? Not a race. They are much too varied in physical type. Not only a religion. They include believers, non-believers, disbelievers. No, the Jews are a people. No more than 14 million, a fraction of 1% of the world's population. About 6 million of them living in the United States, 
over three million in Israel, a few million more scattered throughout the world, but acknowledging a common heritage, a common history that spans time and place. Does their unique story fit into the larger epic of mankind, into the history of empires and civilizations? When and how did they conceive the idea that has been their greatest and most lasting contribution as a people, the idea of God that most of the world's great religions have come to share? That idea is one of the great reaches of the human mind. It encompasses our view of our fellow human beings, of the universe of life itself. But it did not arrive in the world full-blown. It evolved, like the Jewish people themselves, over the course of many centuries. The development of that idea, this people, the civilization in which they originated, that is our subject in the first episode of Heritage, the story of civilization and the Jews. the search for the human past. The fascination is probably as old as the human race itself. The science is new. Maybe there's a word dividing one room from here to the other room here. If it will be, it will be very good. It was only in the early 19th century that archaeologists began systematically sorting the ruins of ancient cultures and deciphering their lost languages. Before archaeology, our main source of information about the ancient world was the Bible. But the Bible is a relatively modern document, an anthology started only about 2,500 years ago by a group of Jewish scholars exiled from their homeland in a foreign capital called Babylon. It was a collection of a people's memories, some written, some only told, about events that were already receding into the distant past. Moses did not know that the skin of his face shone because he had been talking with God. Lorsque Salomon eut achevé la maison de l'Éternel et la maison du roi, Aconteció después de la muerte de Moisés, siervo de Jehová. Wtedy to dwaj mężowie odeszli w stronę Sodomy, a Abraham stał dalej przed Panem. The first five books of the Bible, which Jews call the Torah, the teaching, traced the genealogy of their people, traced it back to a line of godly men, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and Joseph, and before them to an ancient place which was the starting place of all their memories. The Torah calls it Eden, a garden watered by the rivers Tigris and Euphrates. Eden, the legendary site of mankind's origins, the birthplace of our common ancestor, Adam. The name Adam is simply the Hebrew word for human being. From the word for earth, Adama, the red clay from which he was said to have been created. The time, according to the Torah, about 5,800 years ago as Jewish traditionalists would count it, 3,800 years BCE before the common or Christian era. 
Archaeologists tracing the human past have arrived back at this same place at about the same time. It is the place known to history as Mesopotamia, the land between the rivers, the part of the Middle East now called Iraq. Scholars identify it as the starting point not of creation but of civilization. Civilization developed out of agriculture, out of irrigation, which earlier people had devised as a way to temper the droughts and floods of the rivers, to turn chance vegetation into crops they could depend on, turn barren clay into Eden. Irrigation was a social undertaking, more people to share the hard work, the increased flow of water, the increased products of the soil. Irrigation led to communities, and communities became cities. The great process called civilization was underway. Civilization, literally, the culture of cities. Cities first arose in Mesopotamia between 4000 and 3000 BCE. This restored temple is a fragment of one of the earliest cities, a place called Ur, which is mentioned in the Bible as Abraham's ancestral home. It was built long before the Jews as a people entered the story of civilization. Built by a Mesopotamian people called the Sumerians. In outward appearance, those earliest cities probably resembled this one called Taurirt in North Africa. They were mud brick complexes, their walls enclosing a nucleus of public buildings, the temple and the palace, and housing for a population of thousands. Mud brick construction doomed these places to crumble into ruins, doomed the Sumerians to be forgotten their very identity buried beneath the ruins of peoples who followed them. But the Sumerians were, in one historian's phrase, the true inventors of civilization. In the marketplaces of their cities, skills developed into trades. The potter's wheel was a crucial development an early means of mass production. Ancient man was no longer a mere hunter, no longer just a farmer. He was also a merchant and a craftsman. In the cities of Mesopotamia, there were weavers and wool merchants, brewers and bakers, metal workers, dyers, tanners. The wheel was a basic device of civilization and the Sumerians were the first to make use of it. They moved their products in carts pulled by donkeys, vehicles of commerce that soon evolved into a vehicle of war, the military chariot. The Sumerians were the first people known to field an organized army. They also developed the arts of peace. Lives eased by the civilized division of labor found the time to develop music and poetry and painting. On this inlaid panel, found in the ruins of Ur, a Sumerian artist portrayed the life of the third millennium BCE. You are looking at one of civilization's milestones. The picture-like symbols on this tablet are one of the most remarkable of all human inventions, writing. Devised by the Sumerians about 3100 BCE, before Egyptian hieroglyphics, before Chinese ideographs. After various transformations, it emerged as a system of wedge-shaped symbols called cuneiform. With writing, human knowledge could be preserved and transmitted. Writing promoted political development. The rights of citizens 
were established in legal codes. This early code, engraved in stone, was formulated by a Mesopotamian king named Hammurabi around the year 1750. The office of king was a significant development. The earliest leaders had been chosen just for the course of some civic emergency. Now they ruled permanently and handed on their power to their heirs. The kings ruled as caretakers of the gods. These votive figures evoke a world dominated by special deities, gods of various cities, a god of Ur, a god of Eridu, the rival gods of Babylon, Ashur, Nineveh, Nippur, gods that could be seen and felt in the forces of nature, abstract powers like chaos and creation. He created man. He created the beasts of the field. He created the Tigris and the Euphrates, and he set them in their place. This is the story of creation as told in a Mesopotamian myth. Tear down this house. Build yourself a boat. Aboard this boat, take the seed of all living things. This is the story of a great flood in which all of mankind is destroyed except for one deserving family, a story handed down through the generations in Mesopotamia centuries before the story of Noah and his ark would be written into the Bible. All of life in the ancient view was at the mercy of the gods. They're all too human whims and rages. They're perpetual conflicts with each other. The god who appeared as wind, fighting the god of vegetation. Storm god, fighting sea god. Human beings could appeal to the gods through the priests with their ritual magic they could try to learn the mystery of their fate from omens. The entrails of sacrificed animals, the patterns of birds in flight. They might learn their fate, might even deflect it. But in the ways of the gods, they could see no moral pattern, nothing to count on or live up to. That rather chaotic view of the human condition was one that dominated the life and thought of early civilizations. It would begin to change dramatically, permanently, only with the emergence of a Jewish people onto the scene. According to the best evidence of archaeology, that would not begin to happen until sometime after 1500 BCE. By 1500, the cities of Mesopotamia have developed into thriving city-states, rich and potent nations ship their surplus grain and wool and hides across overland trade routes that pass across the countryside of Canaan towards cities along the Mediterranean coast. Ugarit, Byblos, Sidon, Tyre and Gaza. Those were the names of great city-states off the Canaanite coast, ports that maintained contact with other Mediterranean cities like Troy and with Mediterranean islands like Cyprus and Crete. Inland, beyond the coastal plain, there were walled citadels guarding the trade routes that stretched east to Mesopotamia. Along those routes, Canaan exported minerals, textiles and dyes and timber from the cedar forests of Lebanon. The architecture of these cities was indigenous to Canaan Instead of mud bricks, there was plenty of durable stone. But the culture of the Canaanite cities was in many respects an extension of Mesopotamia in their art, their legal codes, their religious outlook. This huge stone platform may have been an altar used for animal sacrifices in the worship of nature gods, deities identified with the cycles of planting and harvest, death and renewal. The chief of the Canaanite deities was Baal, revered as the source of bounty, of fertility. He dominated a pantheon of lesser gods. Baal's female counterpart, the fertility goddess called Ashtoreth or Astarte. This symbol of political power a bronze scepter was found along with a crown in a cave near the Dead Sea. In the Canaanite city-states, 
power was concentrated at the top of a feudal structure. The king, the royal family, the class of warrior knights, they owned most of the farmland beyond the city walls. The civilization of Canaan produced the alphabet, which became the basis of all Western written languages. It was an advance beyond the system of cuneiform symbols, which the Canaanites had learned from the Mesopotamians. It was over caravan routes that Mesopotamian influence arrived in Canaan, arrived with the goods carried by itinerant traders, much like the Bedouin of today. Like these Bedouin, like all peoples, they brought as part of their culture their own lore, their memories handed down from generation to generation, songs, stories, myths rooted somewhere in experience, in fantasy or belief. By the year 1500, generations of travelers had arrived from Mesopotamia. Whole families, tribes, clans had settled in their way among the peoples of Canaan in a land that was still inhabited by lions, its coastal marshes by the hippopotamus. Further centuries would pass before any of the peoples of Canaan could be identified as Hebrews or Israelites or Jews. That would only happen as the consequence of another significant traffic that connected Canaan with a society to the south, a civilization almost as old as Mesopotamia and equally powerful. Egypt, a stable, ponderous society, quick to flourish and slow to change, through dynasty after dynasty of absolute rulers, the pharaohs. The pharaohs reigned as incarnations of the gods, the many complex deities of Egypt. The pharaohs spent their lives preparing to join the gods after death, building tombs like fortresses to preserve their bodies for the journey into eternity. <laughs> 